awesome. He can move mountains. This morning, we have come to worship the awesome God. Awesome. 
Good morning and praise the Lord. Allow me to extend a very warm welcome to you wherever you're joining us from in the world. We are indeed so glad to have you amongst us this morning. And it is a glorious morning, not because of the weather outside, because the weather might be far from glorious. But it's a glorious morning because we're in the presence of Jesus this morning. The Lord is already here. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 29. And I read, Give unto the Lord the glory due to his holy name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Brothers and sisters, this is why we are here, to worship the Lord. This is why we are here, to give him all the glory and to give him thanks and praise. That is due to him alone. So put a smile on your face because he is the King of Kings. There's a song that's been uh, ministering to me uh, the last couple of days. And it goes, King of Kings, Majesty, God of Heaven living in me. Gentle Savior, closest friend, strong deliverer, beginning and end. All within me falls at your throne. Your majesty, I can but bow. I lay my all before you now. In royal robes I don't deserve. I live to serve your majesty. It's a tough world out there on several levels. But as we fall this morning at the feet of Jesus, as we lay our all before him, he can make a way where there is no way. So forget about your worries. Concentrate on Jesus and worship him this morning. Will you do that? Can you do that? God is no man's debtor. As you worship him, he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we ask him. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, because you're already here. We can feel your presence indeed. We praise your name, and as we worship you, O oh God, let your glory come amongst us. Touch every individual at the point of their need. Let our meeting be sweet. Let the sweet aroma of your presence fill the temple. Let your name be praised and glorified. Blessings untold be ours. As we continue on this subject of building your church, let us, found, let us be found with our hands to the plow in Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Why not get up on your feet? Dance and sing with us as I invite the choir to come and lead us in praise and worship. God bless you as you worship with us this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Wherever you are, come on, let's give God the praise because he's worthy. He woke you up this morning. Give him the praise. He's your strength. Give him the praise. He's caused you to rejoice. Give him the praise. He's a good God.
beyond description too marvelous for words somebody love him this morning too wonderful for comprehension oh like nothing ever seen
Praise the Lord. We want to thank God again for another time of prayer that we come into this presence in the name of Jesus Christ. As we know, the theme for this uh, month has been, uh, I will build my church. And in Matthew 16, 18, we see that reference there. Jesus saying, and, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hate or hell shall not prevail against it. Here we see that God is the one who is building his church. And his church is God's people, not a physical building, God's people. So if God says, I'm going to build my church, it implies God is going to build his people. And so if we are God's people, we're going to pray that God will build us to be like Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate pattern that God is building his church to be, his people to be like. So we're going to pray that God will build us to be like Jesus in the way we think, in the way we, we do things, in what we say at every moment, and in our interactions with people. So shall we pray in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you will build us as Jesus, that we shall be like Jesus. We shall think like him. We shall behave like him, Lord. Our, uh, everything that we say at every moment will be like Jesus, Lord. We pray that as we interact with our friends, our, our neighbors, our, our parents, our, our friends, our uh, siblings, Lord, we shall behave like Jesus Christ, as if Jesus is here. Lord, help us in the name of Jesus that our lives will reflect you. Our lives will reflect the light that you have sparkled in us, O oh God. Your intention for building us. Help us in the name of Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, and help us. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 says, As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. As God's co-workers, God is working in us so that in turn, he will use us to work on other people and to work in his kingdom. And so we become co-workers with God. If co-workers, we're going to ask God to help us to collaborate with him, to agree with him, agree with Jesus Christ in the building project of his spiritual kingdom. Let's pray in the name of Jesus that God will help us to agree with him as co-workers with him in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will help us to agree with you, to give ourselves up unto you as you seek to use us, working together with us in your kingdom to expand and to build your church. We pray in the name of Jesus that, Lord, none of us, O God, will have our own way, but we shall flow with you, we shall, we shall move together with you in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, help us in this regard. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Isaiah 61 verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And if God is going to work on us, and we working with him, these are some of the things God is going to enable us to do. When his spirit comes upon us, that we shall reach out to the poor, we shall reach out to the brokenhearted, we shall reach out to the captives and those in prison. So we're going to pray that God, we're going to pray and ask God to pour out the gifts of the Holy Spirit and, and give us skills, pour out his skills upon us as means to help build his church. All the tools that we need. And also we're going to pray that God will enable us to use these skills not for evil purposes, but we shall be instruments in his hands to use in, in spreading out his, his kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we pray that, Lord, even as co-workers with you, we can do nothing without you. All our resources come from you, O oh God. Our dependency is upon you. So we ask you to give us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Pour out your spirit upon us, O oh Lord, that we shall be fervent, we shall be active, we shall be able to move forward, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, pour skills upon us. Give us, O oh God, minds and thoughts and ideas that, Lord, we can move forward in every capacity that you call us to work with you. 
in Jesus' name. Pray that as we, 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 uh, we are being built up, our eyes will be open to also see and discern the needs and heartaches, heartaches around us so that we can help. Because we are supposed to, after anointing has come upon us, we have to reach out to the poor and the broken hearted. Father, we pray that you open our eyes and give us the spirit of discernment so that we can see the needs around us. Lord, Lord, we shall not close our eyes, but we shall discern and move in action by the power of your Holy Spirit. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Now, the last prayer we're going to pray, it says in Nehemiah 4 verse 6, Nehemiah says, So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. People having a mind to work makes the tax very, very easy. Having a mind to work makes it very difficult to be distracted. So we're going to pray that we're going to pray against every distraction that seeks to take our minds off the task Christ has called us to undertake. Shall we pray in the name of Jesus? Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that every distraction that seeks to take our minds off the task which you have called us as believers, each believers, as individuals, as families, Lord, even us as a church. Father, every task we have placed in our hands to do, we pray that we shall not be distracted, O oh Lord. We shall play our role as your Holy Spirit enables us grace to do. This we ask in the mighty name of Jesus. We want to thank you. Thank the Lord that he has heard us. Give him praise and, and glory and honor. Lord, we thank you that you've heard us. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. The God of the second chance. Has my ship sailed? Have I come to the party too late? Has the tide already gone out and important opportunities lost? Where did I miss a turning? These may be the terrifying questions that come to your mind. But then I read of Sarai and Abraham. I have been told of Hannah, she who was called barren. And I remember Samson, how his blatant disobedience and flirting with sin got his hair shaved by the object of his lust. His eyes taken out, made to become the object of amusement for those he was meant to subdue. But he repented, called on God, and his hair began to grow because the Lord heard him when he prayed that heart-wrenching prayer. Then something called to the Lord, saying, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. Judges 16, 28. I also remember Job, who through no fault of his own was presented by God to Satan as a specimen of perfection and how he was attacked by Satan. But then Job persevered and God gave him a way out by means of forgiveness and praying for his human tormentors. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Job 42 and verse 10. And I remember John Mark, who once walked away but was welcomed back because unlike Esau, he found room for repentance. Has the tide already gone out? No, the one who controls the tide will let the tide come in again and your ship will yet set sail taking you into the high seas of adventures in God. Where did I miss a turning? Yes, you may have indeed missed your turning a while back but the Lord and God of our Savior Jesus Christ is merciful and with him there is forgiveness and restoration. The Lord who met Hagar as she fled from Sarai has not stopped his work of intervention. Please listen to this. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be numbered for multitude. 
However, please note, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Galatians 6 and verse 7. Cheer up, child of the living God. You may have strayed, but like the father in the story of the prodigal son, your loving heavenly father is looking out for you. Turn around and head back home. This is what the word of God says. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Romans 11, 29. God is not man, that he should lie, or a son of man, that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Numbers 23 and verse 19. Yes, your sheep did sail, but God has provided another sheep. Yes, you may have come to the party late, but not too late. So, cheer up. Yes, the tide did go out, and important opportunities were lost, but all is not lost. So get up your loins and cheer up. Where did I miss the turning? Cheer up. Like it is on the motorway, God has provided another runabout. Take the next runabout and head straight back home and submit to authorized covering and protection. Perhaps like the prodigal son, there is a party waiting for you. And if there is no party, you will be back home to your family anyhow. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Hello all, and this week's announcements are as follows. The theme for both February and March is, I will build my church based on Matthew 16 verse 18. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church belongs to the risen Christ and he has declared that he will build his church. How are we doing our part as workers together with him? ANC cell groups. Some cell groups have resumed. Voxel cell group will be resuming on the 24th of February. Cell groups are a great way to keep in fellowship. Please visit the ANC website to find your nearest one. Thursday meetings. 2 Timothy 2 And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The Thursday teaching series is led by the Apostolic Church Wolfhamstow. In our ever-changing world, the topics presented are a great opportunity to learn and share on important aspects of our faith. Outreach activities are encouraged in all cell group areas. During February and March, all cell groups are encouraged to continue outreach activities in line with the ANC mission statement, Reaching People, Transforming Lives. Later today, from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. will be the ANC Ladies Evening. The theme will be Prayer is the Master Key. This day and time has been set aside for all our sisters, young and old, to come together to pray and commit all our programs and activities for the year to the Lord Jesus Christ. This will be taking place via Zoom. Mission London 23 Vision Breakfast taking place on Saturday the 4th of March from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Please have your RSVP by the 26th of February. All who have been involved in the turning are encouraged to join this event as preparation gets underway for Mission London 2023. We are all encouraged to pray and fast on the day of your birth until midday or all day if it's possible. The ANC Daily Prayer Topic Bible Reading Plan and Prayer Guide can be used to help with making this a regular routine. Please get in touch with the church office if you do not receive texts or emails and have not opted out. We do send out at least two a week. Please follow, like, comment and share across Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. Thank you so much for your attention. Have a wonderful week. Praise the Lord. Let me take this opportunity to welcome anyone worshiping with us for the first time today. I extend our warmest greetings to you and trust that you have enjoyed the service so far. If this is your first 
time of, of joining our service, I encourage you to put this on the chat and tell us where you are joining from. For our regulars, I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the God bless you as we fellowship together. We have come to the, an important part of our, our service, the giving of our tithes and offerings to the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 and 8, Apostle Paul encouraged us, So let each one give as he purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Oftentimes we stop there, but this is why God loves a cheerful giver. In verse 8, he says, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency of, of all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Praise the Lord. So let us come cheerfully as we bring our tithes and offering to the Lord. The bound details of our various accounts for giving are displayed on the screen. On behalf of the presbytery, I say thank you for your generous and continuous giving towards the work of the church. May the Lord bless you as you give. Amen. We want to see Jesus lift his eye. A banner that flies across the land, across the globe, lifting up the name of Jesus. We want to see Jesus lift his eye.
Matthew 6, third, from verse 31, that we should not worry about what we'll eat or what we'll drink. It also encourages me and tells me that if God cares about the, the, the sparrow, if he cares about the trees, then he did, he surely cares about me. So I should not be discouraged. You should not be discouraged because our God watches over us. Hallelujah. Why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely? For heaven and home When Jesus is my portion My constant friend is He I know he watches me. If his eye is on the sparrow, yes, I know that he watches me. So
thank you for your love. Thank you. Yes, he's watching over me. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, let me just say a big thank you to the living God for another opportunity to share his word. Opportunity, a privilege, but also a responsibility. Preaching God's word is a responsibility. And as I may have shared with you a few times, when we come, we come with a view of um, knowing that uh, we preach God's word, but there is opposition. Applying the spiritual warfare cosmology to preaching. And so I come with that in mind. So I pray for you, my friend, that your mind will be in the right place. I pray that my mind will be in the right place. And I pray that we together will be in the, on the same wave, wavelength as the Holy Spirit so that we can communicate his truth to you. So God help you and God help me as we share his word, as we go on, on, on an adventure in his word. We continue with the theme, I will build my church. We had it, we, 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 um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a continued theme. We've had it in January, February, and we'll have it also in March because there is so much to, to say on the subject. Some will say, well, hang on, don't we have anything else to say? If you consider the, if, 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 if you consider the subject and the declaration, you realize that almost everything that we do in Christianity should be tied into this theme, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, but perhaps I'm pre, 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 preempting myself. So here we go. As I said, my subject is, I will build my church with a strap line, God is at work in you. God is at work in you. Or else, if you want to be a little bit confrontational, is God at work in, at, at work in you? Or else you could say, who is working in you? But let's, let's, be, let's, let, let, let's, let's be friendly. Let's, let, let's, yeah, let's be friendly and say, God is at work in you. Perhaps you can use it as, as a greeting for somebody of course, don't push it too far, otherwise they will think that you are mocking them. Let me read to you some passage, passages of scripture on which I will relate, I will, I will base what I'm going to share with you for these next 25 minutes also. So, our sermon text, our main text is Matthew 16 and verse 8. And I read from the New King James Version. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. You know the background to it, so we're not going to go in, into it. But Peter had made a declaration as to the identity of Christ. And Christ declares to Peter, and I say this, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, simple sentence has so much part in it. I will build the gates of hell. Whoa, hang on a second. What are you talking about? These days, no, you don't talk about these things to Christians. Let's talk about love. Let's talk about that. Christ straight away introduces a subject. My second um, sermon text then comes from Philippians 2, verses 9 to 13. And I read, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name, not a name, but the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And then the last sermon test is taken from John 14, 22, 23. And I read, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with them. And my father will love him and make our home with him. There's quite a lot I want to say. There's quite a fair bit. You know, some, for some of us, our Christianity is very, very abstract. But I don't go for abstract Christianity. I go for Christianity that is, if you prefer the word, livable. It's workable, it's livable, and it's real. Not, 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 not theory, but practice. And out of these three uh, scripture verses we've read, some text verses we've read, you'll find something that is workable. And the little time left for, for me, I will share with you. So, what do you think of this? At creation, the Trinity worked alone. Listen, I said, at creation, 
the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit worked alone. So we read in Genesis 1, 28. Genesis 1, 20, sorry, 20, 20, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. Let us, that's what I said, Trinity, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the bears of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. At creation, God worked alone. And so I make this assertion that since creation, God has sought to involve his children in his work on earth. That's exciting. That's a responsibility. At creation, he said, let us, the Trinity. After that, he said, you go and subdue the earth. So to Moses, God said, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. After God has said, I have come down to deliver them, God says to Moses, come now, and I will send you. Don't forget that what I'm saying now is based on the last statement that I made, which said that since creation, God has sought to include humanity, his people, in his work on earth. So the first example I've just given to you is Moses. God calls Moses, say, come, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to deliver Israel. To Isaiah, God said, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah 6 and verse 8. In the year that King Hosea died, as you know. And then Isaiah says, I hear a voice. And the voice declares and says, Whom shall I send? Based that again on the fact that I said, Since creation, God has sought to include his creation, you and I, in his work on earth. And the last one I'm going to say on this is 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9. We read, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. And then that at least we say that God it says, For we are God's fellow workers. God is working, and we are supposed to work with God. Jesus Christ said, My father is before now, my father has been working, and I am also working. So let me ask you, Mrs. Christian, Mr. Christian, whatever you are, are you working? You know the phrase, are you working hard or hardly working? Some of us need to be asked, are you working hard or hardly working? And that's why some of us are hardly working. And some are working hard. There's some of us. I've included myself. But there we are. Our God is a working God. And he invites you and I to be involved in his work on earth. God gives you desire and power. But as I said, my, 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 my strap line is, God is at work in you. So I go straight to Philippians 2 and 13. But you see, Philippians 2 and 13, first, uh, that, that Philippians 2 begins, or it, it includes a bit that says, Wherefore, therefore God has highly exalted him, and give him a name that is above every other name, so that at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And then, so there are two therefores in that, pas in that, in that short passage. I say, for God is working in you. God is at work in you. So, let me, let, me, let me read from three translations because these days there are so many, many translations depending on uh, who, who is translating it. I read to you from the New Living Translation, Philippians 2.13. For God is working, let me read it calmly. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Say, oh, hang on a second. Notice, God is working in you, giving you the, 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 the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Not to do what pleases you, but to do what pleases him. And then the English Standard Version says this, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. A different slant on it. But the same thing is that God is doing something in you. And then the New King James Version says, It is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. This is a, this is a passage that is packed, or a verse that is packed with so much. And if you and I will stop and consider it, we're all, there's something at work. So I say the logical double act of God. In that verse, we find the logical double act of God. It is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. One must, uh, must first have the will before one can do. You know the saying, where there is a will, there is a way. And God being logical creates in us first, as one version says, the desire. Or else it gives us the will, and then having given us the will to, to, the will to do something, then he gives us the ability or the power also to do what he wants us to do. God brings us to his point of view. He gives us the will. He gives us enough reason and the grace to change our will. You know, God doesn't force us to do anything. God, people say, well, the Holy Spirit made me do it. But no, he doesn't make you do anything. He may speak to you. You do what you want to do. 
And so it is God who works. God is at work. You stop a second. Is God really at work in me? Is God really at work in you? He works in you. Just listen to this and smile and give God praise. For God is working in you. Giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. The desire? Whoa. Do you have a desire to do what pleases God? Or perhaps you have a desire to just please yourself? The world says please yourself. Look after number one. And yet, Philippians 2 and verse 13 says, it is God who is working in you. I think we need to stop and say, God, are you really? In fact, I think that uh, without me being wicked, there are a few things you see. You say, well, is God really working in that person? As someone has said, sometimes you look at some people and say, well, did God really create this person? Not me. I didn't say that. Others have said that. Did God really? Because you see such in them and say, whoa, 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 whoa. What happened? Let's move on. The logical double act of God too. What a mighty God we serve. What a gracious Lord and Father we have. He provides both the will and the desire and then the power or the ability to do of his good pleasure. You know, one of the prayers that people used to pray back in the day. Some, they pray and they say at, at food time. Say some people have food, but they don't have appetite. Some people have appetite and they don't have food. But thank God that God gives us both the food and the appetite. So there we have here. Over here, God gives us the will and the ability to do. But is it automatic? I do not think so. That's why I said he works in us. He works in us to bring us to a place of, uh, of aligning our thoughts to his thoughts. And then we will agree to do Surely you and I can, if we are sincere Christians, we don't have any more excuses. Oh, I can't do it. But no, hang on. But God, there's a place where you can go to where you will have the will, the will to do God's will. If you pardon the expression, and then the ability also to do it. No more excuses. You can't say you have lack of appetite. God provides the appetite. He tells you where to go. Don't forget what we're talking about. I will build my church. And all that we do, the preaching work we do, the breaking of bread, and all that we do, the life that we lead, should all be predicated on the fact that it's based on God's where I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. To think that we have been called to be God pleasers, those who put a smile on the face of God. God's double act. My father will love him, will come to him and make our home with him. Lesson. When God declared to, uh, to Judas, not his character, said, when the man has my, 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 my word and obeys me, will come and make an abode. The reason he comes to indwell so that he can work within us. Let me say that again. The reason God comes to indwell you is so that he can work in you. If you are sitting with somebody, repeat those words to him or her. And perhaps you want to repeat those words to yourself. Abraham Saki, the reason why the, 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 the Christ wants to come and live, the Father and the Son want to come and live in you, is so that they can work in you. It's not because they have nowhere to stay. Of course, his heaven is his home. But he comes to take residence so that he can do some work of grace. I will build my church. Part of that church building process is what God is doing in you and I. And oh, what a privilege, what a joy. Let us allow him to do that. You know something? Full salvation is being and doing. Full salvation is not just being. Being without doing is a waste of time. And you cannot do without, be, without, without, without being. Not just being delivered from the dominion of tyranny and the control of Satan into the kingdom of Christ, the king, but joyfully and powerfully living the life of the redeemed of the Lord. This is one way of glorifying God in our mortal bodies. Doing the work of the kingdom is important. But one must first be, then proceed to do. This is the divine order of things. You know, we say, Esse quam videre, to be is better than to seem to be. And so we want to be. And more than that, we want to do. Food for thought then. Food for thought. Listen to this carefully. Is it conceivable that we, what, what, that all that we do as children of God will be done as part of the declaration of Jesus, which says, I will build my church, and the gates of, of Hades shall not prevail against it? Is it also conceivable that we can see God at work in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure? You want to stop a moment. You take a look at yourself. What have you done today? What did you do last week? And the pronouncements, the things that came out of, you, of your mouth, and the things that you did, can you say, well, can you see the thread of God, the finger of God running through at all? This is, serious. This is a serious question. The conversation, conversation you had yesterday, or even this morning, or whenever it is, 
Is it part of what God is doing inside of you? And so you ask yourself, before you open your mouth to say something or do something, you ask yourself, is this part of the work that Christ is doing in me? And if it's not, you say, whoa, whoa, I should not do that. What an awesome and unstoppable army of God we will be when we all see whatever we do as God working in us. As God working in us. Just think it's possible and work with it, please. Simply put, all we do is done as part of this manifesto of Christ. What an awesome mindset. God is at work in me, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Awesome mindset indeed. Instead of asking somebody, is God at work in you? Perhaps you ask yourself, is God at work in me? Ask, I am asking myself, Abraham Saki, is God at work in you? God is at work in you. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Therefore, because God is working in you, therefore, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Romans 6, 13. Please know what I'm doing. I'm saying to you this. Because God is at work in you, because God is working, working at, in you and, and, and I, to give us a will and ability, because of that, I will not yield. I will not present my members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But rather, I'll present myself to God as being alive from the dead. And my members as instruments of righteousness to God. Hallelujah. If that doesn't please you, nothing else will please you. God is at work in you. And so, don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Because God is at work in you, don't give any opportunity to the devil. Ephesians 4.27. Somebody should say to themselves, if you are tempted, say to yourself, hey, hey, hang on, God is at work in me. And because he's at work in me, I will give no opportunity to the devil. Devil, God is at work in me. There is no opportunity. This, this is God's building ground. This is God's, um, yep, yeah, God is working. So there's no room for you over there. I trust you understand where I'm coming from, where I'm going. Again, because God is at work in me, I will not practice sinning because whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. There you have it. God says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then we read in 1 John 3, it says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. There you have it, my friend. Scripture it's not in isolation. Scripture all comes in compartment. When Christ was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He gave him the answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all that, and your neighbor as yourself. And as he said, on these two commandments hangs the law and the prophets. And on this declaration of Christ that I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it, hangs all that he came to do. He came to set the captives free from the, from the prison of, of the tyranny of Satan. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. It's all part of his redemptive work. I will build my church. Somebody get excited. So however many times you hear that declaration say, it is part of why Christ came. In John 15 verse 8, Christ declares, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Because Christ is at work in you, because Christ at work in me, therefore you and I must bear much fruit. That's part of his build, church building business. Everything that you and I do. So when you sit down in the seat of the scornful, ask yourself, am I really part of the building project of God? He said, no, 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 I must vacate that seat. What is God building and why? Ephesians 3, 8 and 10 tells us this. To me who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to principalities and powers in the heavenly places. There we have it again. When he declared, I will build my church to the gates of hell, he introduced straight away that gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then we come over here saying, the intention of God is this. It's intent that now, the manifold wisdom of God, will be made known to principalities and powers. And when you read principalities and powers, please don't let people tell you about people in government. We're talking of angels, archangels, and demons. That's all it is. Anyone tells you any different, and they are not being truthful. A glorious church. Ephesians 5, 24, 27 says, 
Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Now this is a clincher. And that he might present her to himself a glorious church. What is Christ building? Christ is seeking to build a glorious church. A glorious church is one that brings glory to Christ. A glorious church is that which is beautiful, that shows forth his praises, that makes people say, hey, these are wonderful children of the living God. Who are your parents? Who is your father? Christ is our father. God is our father. That she should be holy and without blemish. No more excuses. I say no more excuses. You say, why be me? Because it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You say to somebody, why are you not, why, why, why are you not working? Well, I don't have a pen. Well, there you have a pen now. I don't have a book. There you have a book now. I don't have light. Well, there you have light now. Well, well, uh, which, which one else? Therefore, no excuses. The excuse that says, I cannot do this, the will of God is, is now taken away. Why? Because he gives you the will. When he offers you the will, it's up to you and I to reach out and to take it from him. When we allow the word of God to inform our thinking, our actions, our desires, uh, we, then we are cooperating with him by joining God in his church building process. To do otherwise is to oppose his, 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 his work. Listen to this. Why is God working in you? Why has God come to dwell in you? He's come to dwell in me so that he can work in me. Why is he working in you? Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. It is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is all part, I will build, part of his I will build my church work. And we told that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. The reason God is at work in me, the reason why God is at work in you is so that when he shall appear, we would look like him. He doesn't want to look one way, we look something else. But we all look like him. We have the same father. We have the same family. And families look alike. Isn't that, isn't that tremendous uh, revelation to you? He's working you to bring you to a place that when he appears, we don't look like a mishmash of people, but one father. A semblance. Identity. Behold what manner of love the father has bestowed on us. That we should be called children of God. Just this morning, and it's not your morning because this is a recorded sermon. Just this morning, I was in a prayer meeting where the, the subject, the fatherhood of God and the possibilities of prayer was discussed. Listen, the fatherhood of God. God being our father. And this verse came up. Behold what man of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. If you are God's children, then God is your father. And so, if you marry, if you merge, if you put together possibilities in prayer with the fatherhood of God, you have something tremendous. You have dynamite on your hands. Because nothing else becomes impossible. When you make your claims in prayer, don't forget we're talking about and, uh, that God is awake in us. And God is awake in us because he prays through us. When we talk of the, when we talk of the possibilities in prayer, and the fatherhood of God, we say, we have a basis on which we come to him. You know, Christ said, it's not right to take a children's food and give it to the dogs. The word children means that there's a parent. There is a father. Christ said, when you pray, say, our father. A common fatherhood. And over here, we have John telling us what manner of love the father has bestowed on us. That manner of love is on the basis that we can come to him as a father. That's my father. What privilege. When Christ was speaking about the Holy Spirit, he said to the Jews, you wicked, you wicked fathers know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more then will your heavenly father not give you the Holy Spirit? For you who are struggling in prayer, please go to God and say, God, 
you are my father. Notice we said, God is awakening us. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you praise for this wonderful revelation. Lord, I pray that somebody will catch this. Somebody will catch this in their spirit that if they are failing in prayer because they haven't related to you as a father. And anybody who will relate to you as a father will come to you. And so he says, we pray on the basis when you pray, say, our father. You ask because on the basis of his fatherhood, because I am related to you. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not, because it did not know him. Let us close in prayer, my friend. Exciting news. God is at work in you. Exciting news. God is at work in me. Exciting news. God is at work in us. Or else, let us allow God to work in us. Why? To give us both the will and the ability. Or as the other version says, the desire and the power. Desire and power. The man who has a desire and the power is not impotent. It's powerful. It's awesome. The woman has both the desire and the power. It's an awesome power. And the church of God that has both the desire and the power is so awesome. Hallelujah. I'm so excited. Prayer should be very exciting. When you come on the basis of the fact that God is at work. My father is at work in me. So he says, come boldly to the throne of grace. That throne is the throne of your father. Why don't you just lift your hands and just worship him. Say, Lord, I thank you that. I have a father. We sing the song, we say, I have a father, he will never, never fail me. I am grateful, Lord, for this revelation. Bit by bit, you are building us up, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. This awesome army that sees God as a father, that sees God as a father, and on that basis comes the throne on the basis of his fatherhood. Jesus, I give you praise. May we catch this, my father, in our spirits. Let your name be glorified. Continue, Lord. On your manifesto that says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We want to give God thanks and praise and adoration for his word unto us this morning. You say the God that we serve is our father and he is at work in your life and in my life. You want to thank God that his servant has spoken as indeed God has led him and he's been faithful to God's word. The songwriter says, I have a father, almighty father. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So, let us hold on to our God. Let us know our God. And let us know that he's always faithful to us. So, this morning I want you to go, not only listening to the word, but using that which you have received from God's servant this morning. And we want to say thank you. Thank you to God for the opportunity you have this morning to listen. But it is better for you not only to listen, but to do that which God wants you to do. And God will richly bless you. Now let's go to our declaration. The presence of God will be with me and mine as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And I will drink from the rivers of the delights of my God. I, am, I will know the real contentment of the Lord in all my ways and in all its ramifications. I'm looking forward to be back to in-person service stronger and fitter for the master's use and for his glory. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 13, 14 for our doxology. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen and amen. So I say 
to everyone. Shalom, shalom, shalom. And God be with you. Amen. Thank you for listening to God's Word. We are the Apostolic Church All Nation Centre in Kennington, London. Find us at Tyus Terrace, Kennington, London, SE11 5LY. Our telephone number is 0207 820 On the web, we are at www.apostolic-anc.org. All Nation Centre, reaching out to you in practical and caring ways.